What does amber, moldavite, obsidian, opal, and shungite have in common? Are they are they all minerals, sir? Not quite. Now, to conform to the strictest definition of a mineral, something has to conform to five specific and separate pieces of defining criteria. So it needs to be naturally occurring, meaning it has to have occurred naturally, fairly obvious. It needs to be inorganic, which means that it can't have sprung from tree or plant or animal matter. Three, it needs to be stable at room temperature. So we don't want it to be sort of changing its atomic structure depending on the temperature, unless that temperature becomes quite extreme. Four, it needs to have a clearly defined chemical composition. And five, it needs to have a repeatable and organized atomic structure. Now, as soon as we lose one or more of these characteristics, it becomes what's known as a mineraloid, which essentially means mineral-like. All of the things that I've shown you in the video up until this point, things like shungite, things like opal, but also things like pearl, for example, cannot be considered a mineral in the strictest sense because they lose one of these criteria. Take something like opal. Opal is what's known as a hydrated amorphous silica mineral. Now, the most important word in this, this is going to be amorphous, so without form. This is an extension of the fact that it doesn't have a repeatable, organized atomic structure, like something like quartz. You see these spiky terminations, which are repeatable. They're predictable because they're organized. The silicon and the, uh, silicon and the oxygen atoms layer on top of each other in the crystal lattice and are repeatable and very organized. So it's, it's very predictable. Whereas something like opal, for example, is amorphous, which is an extension of the fact that the, the atomic structure is very chaotic. There's no discernible organization or predictability to the way that the atoms layer on top of one another. The same will be true of things like obsidian, which is a glass. Now, glass is very often referred to as a crystal. It's in fact, glass merchants very deceivingly refer to it as crystal glass. Glass is not a crystal. So even traditional glass that you'd have in your windows, for example, there's no real order or predictability to the way that the atoms layer on top of one another. In fact, interestingly, if you look at very, very old glass, if you look at, say, if you go to somewhere like Stratford upon Avon or go to somewhere with very, very, very profoundly old window panes, you'll notice that they're thicker at the bottom than they are at the top. That is because glass is always in a state of dynamism. So it's always moving, uh, but just very, very slowly, so imperceptibly that it's not even really worth discussing. But uh, as soon as hundreds of years will pass, you'll notice window panes are very bottom heavy because believe it or not, the atoms or the material is actually always constantly sliding to the bottom, but just so slowly that it's imperceptible. So glass, which obsidian is a volcanic glass, does not conform to the strictest definition of a mineral or something like pearl. Now the aragonite and the calcite or the calcium carbonates that make up pearls are bound together by an organic material known as nacre, which is kind of like a defense mechanism which springs from, from, from a clam or a mollusk or an oyster as a means of defending against it from external uh, material like sand or some kind of grit or something like that. So if a mineral, mineral like obsidian or shungite or opal or jet, which is decayed plant matter, for example, doesn't conform to these five pieces of criteria, and I'll repeat them, they are occurring naturally, they are stable at room temperature, they're inorganic, a repeatable and discernible chemical composition, and a repeatable structure, atomic structure. If it doesn't meet all of this criteria, it's probably going to be a mineraloid.